in case you can't see out the window behind me, it's a rainy day, and there's not much you can do on a rainy day. I usually like to go on bike rides, but I can't really do that. But the other thing that I like to do that I can do on a rainy day is build flutes, like this one. So I figured I have the materials, and I've got a camera, and I've got the time, so I'll make a tutorial, video tutorial, on how to build this flute. It sounds pretty good, and it's pretty versatile, has a lot of range, can do a lot of things. Let's build one. Here's a rundown of the things you'll probably need in order to build this flute. And yes, there's a lot of things. So this one is a tuner. This one's, well, you don't need the pencil case, just a pencil and a ruler. This one's a TI-84 Plus calculator. You don't need the expensive one, just something that can do powers. And this is a two-foot piece of three-quarter inch pipe. You might want a little more than two feet. This is just a regular kitchen knife. And... You don't need the piece of pipe attached to this, but you need a 45 degree elbow like this, and a coupling. These are all 3 quarter inch, so it has to fit on the same pipe. This is a hacksaw, a rasp, and a drill. Oh, and you might need a piece of modeling clay. I'll go get that. So when we move on to actually building the flute, the first step is to make the fipple. This is the fipple for the existing flute. It consists of a piece of 45 degree elbow into which the player breathes and the air slips through this little crack here which you can see I carved out with a rasp it just kind of fits under the edge of this elbow here and the air is forced over this hole into this wedge here where it can either go in or out and then the end of it is attached to a coupling which basically attaches to a flute or any piece of pipe, anything that resonates, and that's how it makes a sound. Next step is to make the hole for the fipple. It should be just outside the edge of the 45 degree elbow right here. So to, uh, to get a location for this, just put on the 45 degree elbow and go ahead and drill a hole right about there but I'm gonna put down the camera to do it because, you know. So I used a 9 30 seconds drill bit for this and I made the hole a little wider than it is long. That's generally the shape you'll want, but I'm gonna correct the exact shape with a knife later on. But for now what I want to do is stop the hole up, well not the hole, but the end of the pipe with wax or clay. I'm gonna use modeling clay. Basically, all you need to make sure is that the hole is completely plugged up so that it's airtight. You can just blow on the end of it, make sure no air gets through. But the purpose of doing this is to force all the air to travel not through the middle of the pipe, but around the outside. But there's nowhere it can go until we carve that air channel, which I'm going to do next. This part is where we use the rasp. Now, I just kind of like to drag it across here in this kind of motion, but the idea is to make a space where the air can travel between the edge of the 45 degree elbow and the pipe itself. So here's a useful tip. After you've carved crossways, you can run the rasp like this parallel to the pipe to make the air channel deeper. So now I've carved out my air channel. You can see it starting to have some depth there. That's good. You want to pretty much give it as much depth as you can before risking the loss of quality of sound. But one hint that it's going well is if you breathe into it like this, and you hear that sound, that means it's resonating. But now the problem with this is that the other side of it the wedge right here is not very wedge shaped. It doesn't really do its job well, so I'm going to carve this out next. 
So the first thing I'm going to do is just cut along here to make sure that the edge of the fibula is more or less flat. It'll just kind of aim the air better. This part of the fibula is meant to be like a wedge, so you need to make it wedge-shaped so that the air is aimed straight at it and the air can go in or out, but it doesn't have anywhere in between. So to do that, just kind of make strokes with the knife like this until it's down to the edge and it's a sharp edge. So now that I've done some carving and I've got my fiddle into a better shape, I want to test it out. You hear how much louder and better that tone is. Not to say it's the most beautiful sound in the world, but I think it's a big improvement. So now I'm going to attach it to this long pipe here to see if it can resonate the whole pipe. It's pretty good, but it's a little lacking in volume. So I'm going to see if I can carve out the air channel a little more to kind of bring more air in so it can just kind of have a stronger current and make a better sound. So I found two ways to improve the sound without really doing much to the shape of the fibula itself. One of them was just sliding the 45 degree elbow back a little bit, which allowed more room for the air to resonate, which was, I guess, what it needed. The other way was pushing the clay forward. I just kind of kept the knife here and pushed it with my finger so it was kind of slanted like this. And this can help make the higher harmonics in tune. It can really help with that. So, I think I've pretty much done everything I need to with this fiddle, so I'm going to move along and build the rest of the flute. Next step is to take a tuner and try to cut the pipe to the length that you want it to play the starting note, which for me is middle C. So I'm going to play middle C, and here's the pipe. So it's pretty flat, so I'm going to cut off a still kind of small piece, because I don't want to cut off too much. It's much better to cut off too little than it is to cut off too much. Now the tricky thing about tuning is that you want a little room to tune a little flat or a little sharp. You see, this connector piece right next to the fiddle serves as a tuning slide, so when it's pushed all the way in, it should be just a little bit sharp. So be careful when you're tuning the flute, you know, just keep that in mind. Alright, so I've got my tuning where I want it to be. So here's the part where the calculator comes in. But first you have to measure the total length of the pipe. And to do that, you need to measure the pipe as if the fiddle is the very end of it. So I would measure from the far edge of the fiddle to this end right here. And I didn't bring a measuring tape, so I'm just going to use the ruler and just kind of add up the numbers. Okay, now here's the mathy part. So, if you have a simpler calculator, I don't blame you. Um, you don't have to use this exact method. But what I'm doing is entering 61.1, which is the length in centimeters, and dividing it by the twelfth root of 2, which is 1.059. So to find the length of a pipe that is tuned one half step up, from the length, you just divide the length by 1.059, or more accurately, the twelfth root of 2, and you just kind of repeat this over and over again. So that's the way you do it on probably a less fancy calculator. On this one, I just enter this equation, which subtracts the length of the new pipe from the length of the old pipe, so I can just measure it from the edge of the whole pipe and I just go to the table and enter my numbers. Let's say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Just going up in whole numbers since this is chromatic. 
and that tells me exactly how many centimeters from the edge of the pipe the hole should be. So I made my markings from 1 to 11 because that's how many notes you need to play a chromatic scale. But the thing is, I can tell you right now, these are not where the holes are going to be. These are where the very end of the pipe would be if I could just cut the pipe off right there. I could assure you it would be a half step up. But that's not what the situation is. The situation is I'm going to make holes that are about half an inch wide, which is already not as wide as the pipe itself because my fingers aren't that big and also these holes are not going to have a shape where it's just like they cut off the exact length of the pipe there they're kind of more gradual so you need to offset the holes and I can tell you just by experience about how much you need to do this the first one would be right about here second one here, third. You just kind of move a little more and more away from the markings as you go up. So, for the last couple, you might even be, well, this marking, the hole for this marking might actually be all the way to the next marking and maybe even beyond. So, in the end, these markings aren't really exact markers. They're just kind of an approximation of where the hole should be but this method works pretty well. What you really need to do is just tune it by ear and once you get a feel for it you can just make your flute reliably in tune. So to actually make the holes I use a 3 8 drill bit and I go ahead and just drill a starter hole but the thing is the holes are about half an inch wide so what I do is I kind of wiggle it around in a circle to make the hole bigger the bigger the hole is, the sharper the notes tuning will be, but once the holes reach this size, that's only a minute difference, so you shouldn't really rely on size for tuning, you should rely on position on the pipe. That's more important at this point. The positions of the tips of your fingers is kind of a curve, so a good thing to do is just drill a tiny little dent where your fingertip is going to be and just by feeling that dent you can get an idea of where the hole should be exactly. So now I made the hole wider and I'm going to make sure that it's in tune by playing it along with the tuner. As far as I can tell that's about perfect. But the thing is, you need to stop at every hole, or almost every hole, to make sure that they're in tune. I mean, really, you can estimate it, but it's still good to check, just to make sure that your estimates are on track. I've drilled the first couple holes, they're all in tune so far, but now that I've drilled four finger holes, I have my first thumb hole. What I'm gonna do is make a marking right here, and just kind of extend this to the underside of the pipe. Make sure it's in line right there. Just This is where the thumb hole is going to be. And I just have to make sure it's all matched up. But once it's there, I can just kind of pick up the flute and curve my fingers around and make sure the thumb hole is where I want it to be, where it feels good to put my thumb. And so, once you've got a feel for it, just go ahead and drill a little test hole, and then if you're satisfied with that, go ahead and drill the rest. So now I've worked my way up, and I'm ready to make my last two thumb holes. And as you can see, well, I really had to push the holes up. I mean, at first it was just from here to here, but now, this hole right here would have actually gone with this marking so they're already to the next marking and beyond so I might have a little difficulty making the markings for the last two holes but I'll give it my best and see what happens I think I'm just gonna trace the pattern of the holes and extrapolate from that so that the second last hole would go 
somewhere around here, and then the last hole probably go here. I mean, that's my best eyeballing. But now, you see, I gotta pull the same trick here and just mark the underside where I marked the top of it. And, in case you're wondering why there are two thumb holes for one thumb, well, the reason is the thumb is really the only finger that can take care of two holes, and the reason that there are two holes is because if it's chromatic, you need 11 holes, because with all of them pressed down, that counts as a note, but there are still 11 different combinations. So, basically, you don't have enough fingers for that. Well, to be honest with you, I really kind of undershot it here. I made these holes way too far down the flute, so I had to make them super huge, and they're still flat. So, the lesson you should learn here is, the last two holes should be more offset than the rest of them, because, I mean, they're so close together, and your thumb has to take care of both of them. You know, I did it perfectly on this one. Uh, I guess I can use this as a model. Yeah, you can kind of see the difference there. They're not quite in line with the rest of them, but this is what you should do, and this is what you shouldn't do. I guess I'll show you what to do now, which is rasping down the holes to make them, well, more playable. I mean, that sounds like a good thing, right? So basically, you just take the rasp, put it like this, and drag it across the flute like that. That kind of motion. But this requires two hands, and it's tedious. And so I'll, I won't show the whole thing, but eventually what you're trying to get to is this, where the holes have a nice little level place around them, you know, where you can comfortably and easily put your fingers, that kind of thing. So I guess just follow those instructions, except uh, get it right on the last step, and you'll be fine. I mean, this isn't the easiest flute to make, but... It's the most versatile one that I make. What you should take away from this is that there are methods to making flutes, and you can copy exactly what I do, but your best bet is just play around with it, you know? Just have fun. Make your own thing. That's it.